Okay, so welcome to the first session. And uh, again, as I mentioned, it's about, you know, step into my brain. I'll be thinking out loud as I do troubleshooting, and I'll show you some techniques, some housekeeping. So I will be the uh, Packet Challenge Awarder. Did not realize that, but that's me. Um, my contact information is right there. You'll be able to download this presentation along with packet capture files. Now, usually I embed them into the uh, PowerPoint, the actual PCAP files, but since it gets converted to PDF, um, it's usually useless. So if you, when I give this to Janice, uh, in this page right here will be a link on box.com uh, that will have access to both the PowerPoint, although there's no animation, so PDF doesn't really matter, but there will be a link where you can download the packet trace file and also the profile that I use for Wireshark. And you'll see what I'm talking about in just a second. And then the, because I was motivated by the fascinating history uh, that we heard this morning, um, there's a random fact for you. My first protocol analyzer uh, in the 80s, I think it was, was called the Spider Analyzer. It might be called SPY, I, mean, I don't even remember. Uh, and it was from UK. This predates Network General Sniffer. Okay, so that was when I got hooked on it. And um, for those of you that might have heard the story, it was actually um, a, a luggable laptop went missing in a in physics department. And because the network was all bridged back then, and I was maintaining the boot peak table, and we had this fancy new tool, I was fascinated by watching the packets flying around. And when the laptop went missing, the professor called us and said, you think you can find it? And I said, yeah, if they plug it in, I can see every MAC address in the entire campus. And I set a little alert. And sure enough, two weeks later, I got an alert. The laptop was on the network. We had this fancy uh, manageable hubs. So I knew what, what hub port it was connected to. We traced it. And it was some idiot two, three doors down. Okay. So I was like, well, you, if you steal it, Take it home, don't bring it back. <laughs> <laughs> and you're a professor, and uh, so anyway, so above and beyond that, the fact that you can see these packets flying around the wire was fascinating to me. I was hooked, and I started doing this. Okay, so that's the genesis of today's session, and that's the end of PowerPoint. All right, so I will close that out. Um, the first one, this one is uh, interesting because uh, here's a troubleshooting scenario, you need to understand the motivation of why this happened. Two servers sitting on the same switch would drop off the network, one or the other. Um, and it was reported as something's wrong with the network, and I said, well, maybe, but unless there's a bad patch cable, or one port on a switch is bad, or and I ruled out the ASIC, I ruled out the blade, I did my due diligence, swapped out the cable, there wasn't anything else to swap out. Two servers sitting on the same switch, the log, the application log would say, network connectivity problem, contact your network administrator. Okay, that was, those were almost verbatim, the, the wording on the thing, and so I said, hmm, how the hell am I gonna troubleshoot this, right? I can rule out the infrastructure, it's either the ASIC, the blade, or the cable. Nothing else in the middle. Rule them all out. So one of my very, very smart essays said, you know what? I'm going to start a ping script. Every second, I'm going to ping. So why, was the, why did he decide to do this after I talked to him? Because the application works at what protocol level? TCP, okay? Um, so if the application breaks, and that means TCP is not working, but if ping works, which is at the IP layer, I know, I've proven, that it's the application or socket level problem and not the network, even though the network, again, consists of just a patch cable, essentially. Okay? So that was the motivation behind this ping request. And sure enough, you're seeing here when things fail. Okay? This is a snippet of things are working, all of a sudden, application drops off, we get an alert from the application team, and we collect the ping log, and this is what we see. So, I'm not gonna go through my technique yet, even though I said I'll walk you through it, because this is not a TCP, so it's a little bit different. Um, but I do always scroll down to see what's happening, and you can see immediately what's wrong, right? You're sending out a ping request, but there's no reply, okay? Right, everybody see that. 
ping is pretty stupid in terms of complexity, right? You just ping, you get an answer back, that's it. Nothing else goes wrong with ping for the most part. And I'm sitting here, and I'm sending out a request, and all of a sudden I see a reply. What could account for ping not working? This is where you step into my brain part, and, and you start to think out loud. Firewall, except it's on the same switch, same ASIC, same blade. No firewall in the middle. I heard it over here from somewhere. One more time. You have, you have to say a little louder for me. MAC address. Okay, so when I'm going to check the dinner right there, I say, well, if it's IP or Ethernet, that's it. Let me check the MAC address. Right? Simple as that. So as you scroll down, and this is where pattern recognition comes in. I always talk about pattern recognition. Okay? In, in, so I'm multitasking. Or in my mind, I'm thinking, you know, I need to check the MAC address because there's really nothing else to check. I check the IP address, TTL. These are the usual things. I rule them out. And MAC address. And all of a sudden here, I get a reply. So now I have an interesting point where I can deep dive. This is a transition state. Not working, working. Okay? Working, not working. Those, and they talked about inflection point. When you're troubleshooting, those are your inflection points that you need to zoom in on because something changed. Some variable was introduced, taken out, not working, 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 not working. And here's a case right here. Um, we see that, I see, I get a reply back from 254. Here, um, I don't get a request reply here. How do I know which request reply there is? Because right in the ICMP message, it tells you the identifier. Um, and so you can match up what the, uh, which request or reply it wants. All right. You can see ID here, um, et cetera. OK, so I see a reply here to this, presumably to this request. And then all of a sudden, I get a request and a reply. So what's different about this that's not working? versus this, that is working. Not working, working. Yeah, well I already given you the answer, right? I already told you look at the MAC address. But in my mind, as I'm doing this, I'm doing both things. I triggered a little thing in my brain that said, you should pay attention to MAC address. And as I said, scroll down, it immediately jumped out. Because my brain was focused on this area right here. Okay. And let me see if I remember another. So, I can zoom in. And then I can do this and say, that's the part right there that's interesting. Oops. All right. So if you, if you look down, you can see here that you don't have to memorize anything. You're just looking for things that change in the screen. And sure enough, right there, we go from Dell to Oracle. Okay. Dell, here's my Dell destination. And all of a sudden, the Mac destination changes to Oracle. So what caused that? What would cause something like that to happen? Arch spoofing was uh, the first thing we thought about. Okay. Now arch spoofing you can find out by looking at other art messages, etc. Right. So we ruled out the usual, and then we opened up a case because we ruled out it's not arch spoof arc spoofing; it's just art getting confused. So we opened up a ticket with a vendor, and there was a problem with this chipset and Ethernet driver, and it would randomly hijack a MAC address. Simple as that. Okay. Now this is the one case where it kind of broke my rule, which is, you know, you've all heard me say this before. If you hear horse, or horse, <laughs> if you hear horses uh, hoof beating, the rum, the rum, the rum, think horses, not zebra. Okay. Or actually, the correct way to say that is if you hear animal hooves beating, the dum the dum the dum, think horses, not zebra, go attack the most common ones first, spoofing, etc. I would not have chosen uh, a driver issue as my top one or two. But once I ruled those out, I had no other recourse but to open up a ticket, and they said, oh yeah, sorry, that's a bug. <laughs> <laughs> okay. yeah, sorry. Pretty, pretty big bug, considering this is from a data center. But be that as it may, we found it very, very quickly. Okay? So this is a kind of an easy case. We teed it up. Any questions uh, on this one? It's pretty, pretty simple 
What's important is the troubleshooting technique of separating the layers. Okay? If you don't know what the hell is wrong, and you don't know where to start, divide and conquer. Okay? You don't have to troubleshoot TCP because IP is not working. If IP all of a sudden works, the only thing that's changed is the Ethernet layer. Okay? So by doing dividing and conquering, we were able to quickly find the root cause for this problem. That was what the lesson is in this trace file, because it's not that difficult. All right. Any, no other questions on that one? All right. The next one we're going to do is this one. So this is one where my buddy calls me up and said, Hansan, I'm logging into a Unix box, and it takes me minutes after I tried to log in. It takes me minutes before I get my prompt back. Yeah, I'm connecting. It takes minutes. What's the deal? So my immediate answer was, go check with the DNS team, have them do a reverse lookup on you at the uh, reverse, you know, the DNS entry for reverse lookup and you'll be fine. Click. He said, oh, okay. So why did I say that? Because Unix boxes, when you log in, want to do a reverse lookup on you, and depending on the DNS timeout, it can take a while before, yeah, you know, I give up. I'll, I'll just log you as an IP address as opposed to host name. And I was that confident because it's, it fits that profile perfectly. I moved on. He gives me a call back and said, no, no, no. I can do a reverse lookup. That's not it. So then caught my interest. If it's not DNS, what could it be? Right? So I said, let's do a packet capture. Simple as that. So this is the packet capture. You'll notice that I have some columns here that doesn't come out of the box. Um, that delta time is displayed, cumulative bytes, um, sequence number, next expected sequence number, acknowledgement, acknowledgement four. So I know that this is acknowledging packet number six. It, it's a quick way of me determining how fast the network is, how fat and latency uh, bound I am. The farther the distance between acknowledgement four that you see there, uh, the more data has been transmitted. Okay? So it's just a quick way of following through. And again, it's, this is called my default profile. Uh, I have a bunch of them that I use for troubleshooting. Okay? And on Thursday session, I'll use some of these other ones and tell you why I have these views. They're here for a reason. They're not here just because I want to create profiles. Okay? It helps me quickly move and, and isolate problems. So the first rule that I, I follow, um, I scroll down. Why do I scroll down? I'm looking for patterns. Okay? So in that case, I'm going to just make this pane a little bit bigger. And this is all I do. And already my brain is like, oh, that's interesting. Okay? Why do I say that? And I can scroll very, very fast like this. Okay? And my brain is picking up, believe it or not, a lot of information right now. Okay? And this couple things have happened. The thing that I didn't tell you, which I should have initially, was that the client is 192.168.1.1. The server is 50.50, the first conversation. Okay? Immediately as I scroll down, the address changed. This 7575 guy popped in. And it's very, very chatty. Okay? And I have no idea what that is. Don't know. Legitimate, could be. Okay? But as I'm scrolling down, look at my time since packet capture. 21 seconds into the trace, I haven't seen my original IP address of 1.1. Okay? So I'm thinking, hmm, this could be my smoking gun. I don't know, but it could be. It's interesting because it just randomly pops up. Okay? And clearly this was captured at the server, not at the client, because I'm seeing server's interaction. Okay? And by the way, the, the co cooking show part of this is that I did first capture from his app. <coughs> And then I saw that mysterious delay, and I said, well, I can't account for this, so I need to capture at the server. Okay? So again, uh, knowing enough that you don't have information, capture from somewhere else to get additional information, and here it is. Okay? Now, in the interest of time, I'm going to cheat once again, and <coughs> actually, if I cheat, uh, I'm going to go to conversation pair. Now that I'm seeing other conversation, I want to see what's involved what I'm up against. And I see I have four TCP um, conversations. There's my guy that I care about, 1.1, going to 50-50. And then this is that secondary conversation that we saw, right? That real chatty 50-50 to 75-75. Right? Everybody see that? 
So the one thing that I always do here is I always start click on relative start number uh, to see what's happening. And the, the problem symptom was two to three minutes of delay. And we timed it and it was about two minutes. Okay. I log in, nothing happens, I don't get a prompt, I don't get anything for about two minutes, and then I get the conversation back. And I'm off and running. Okay. So as I'm looking at this screen, something catches my eye. Right? Because I, I'm not actively looking for these things. These are things that you will learn and train your brain to look at. Anybody see something that's of interest? Lots of packets to uh, Okay, there are a lot of packets uh, to this, this guy here, right? 5,000 packets, and there was something else over here, but remember you got to speak out loud because I have a hearing loss. So that's 115 seconds duration, so it works Okay, so we got, here's a duration of 140, right? And then there's a guy here with 129, right? But his relative start time is 129, but I do have 16 and few other conversations here. Okay, so clearly something is going on. There's something else that happened here, okay, which we'll get to in just a second. So again, I'm not troubleshooting at this point, I'm just collecting data, right? The zettabyte of data that we're supposed to collect by 2020, that's what my brain does, that's what you should train your brain to do. Just collect data, randomly file them away, and then it'll come to you and it'll become useful uh, later. All right, so I have all this other conversation in this trace. I'm going to isolate it for my client. I put that editor equal equal 192, 1.1. I click on it. This is my conversation, my Telnet conversation. Okay, I can see my Cincinnati. I scroll down again. All right. And the next thing I do after I scroll down is I do TCP analysis.flags. So instead of typing TCP analysis.flags, I have a button for it and it's empty. This means that from a Wireshark RFC perspective, no packet loss, no duplicate acts, no retransmission, nothing. It was so clean. It's not congestion issue, it's not anything else. Okay. All right, so then I sort by delta address. So this delta column is actually delta time as displayed. That's the one you should use, it's the most useful. Um, and um, I'm not gonna go into the mechanics of how to add that because I have online sessions that you can watch um, to do that. But um, if you don't know, ask me and I'll help you uh, offline. And I scroll down. And I see the base here. And I'm sorry. What I'm looking for here is when I sort by delta, I'm looking for the biggest delta because that's your biggest pain point typically. The other number that I'm looking for is numbers that are doubling in time. Okay? What do I mean by numbers doubling in time? A transmission from one source to a destination, it only happens when there's a retransmission. Okay, but I still check because that's what my brain is trained to do. And I'm looking for numbers that double in time. Why would I look for numbers that are doubling in time? Meaning, if the, from here to here, the delta time doubled, and if from here, here to here, same source, same destination, the number, it went from two to four, it's very interesting use case. Why would I look for doubling time? Back off. It's a complete black holing of traffic. TCP has a timeout, re, uh, retransmission timeout, that when I set something and I don't hear back, after a timeout occurs, I will retransmit, okay? This is very different than what's called fast retransmission, okay? I'm not gonna get into that because I covered them in the previous year, but everybody here, almost everybody here is the first year, so uh, my only advice is go back look at the other sessions, but there is a big difference between fast retransmission, which incurs almost no penalty, to retransmission timeout, which gives you horrendous performance. That's why I look for doubling in time, okay? And you'll see in a, in a, tra a few traces later how you can spot those. So that's not it. Nothing too interesting there. So let's sort by my client again. Apply it. So now this is my conversation for just a 
the display filter of my 18161.1, I sort by, and sure enough, there's my smoking gun, right? The very last thing is 131 seconds of delta. This is delta time is displayed. So between packet number 6630 and packet number 6631 that you see here, let me zoom in, okay? That 131, millis 131 seconds of delay matches the pain point of for about two minutes, nothing happens. I found my smoking gun. Well, I found my smoking symptom. Now let's find the smoking gun, okay? And this one's actually pretty easy, okay? Because as I saw this in the back of my mind, I remember thinking, you know, there was a conversation that lasted a long time. Other conversation from the server not pertaining to my 192.168.1.1 guy, okay? So I know there's about 131 seconds of delay for my conversation, my traffic of interest. Let me clear this, go back to mine, and confirm by looking at the conversation. TCP, relative start, start time. And you can see that this conversation starts, uh, this is the beginning of time, I start my conversation. Very, very quickly, some other conversation starts between some server. There's another conversation that's for 16 seconds in time, followed by 129 seconds, okay? So let's see this from a uh, picture or a packet perspective. So here's my conversation that took 131 seconds of delay. Okay. Notice this delta is 0.39 because this is a delta from this packet to this packet which and this packet. So this is why delta time is displayed is important. Okay. So anyway, so let's go to uh, the first packet here. Um, this is my conversation and all of a sudden this other conversation starts. Okay. Now, to be fair, at this point I used a different tool to visualize the conversation. And I use a different tool because I like to see things in a graphical uh, manner when I troubleshoot. But at the same time, I did something back in the days and I emailed the this, uh, core developers uh, through Wireshark mailing list and I said, hey, it'd be nice if I could see kind of a sequence like diagram to visually see the conversation because it helps in troubleshooting. Okay? And Saki's sitting right there, he probably doesn't even remember but a couple days later, he said, is this what you were looking for? I'd never met him before, right? Because this is pre-Shark Fest. And um, I said, yeah, that's exactly what I was looking for. So let me show you what Saki wrote. I think it took you like three days, which pisses me off. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm being honest, because I wish I could do that, and I can't. So graphically, this is what it looks like. Okay? Let me make it a little bit bigger. Me, this is my... And the client, and then the other 7575 that I talked about. As I scroll down, you can see I am logging in, it's port 22, SSH. And I come down here, and all of a sudden the column shifts from 50 to 75. Okay? Not much time has elapsed. Don't let the, the number of packets fool you into thinking, wow, this is a long time. It's not. It's only been a half a second since I initiated my uh, telnet conversation. Okay? Or, and then all of this occurs, and I scroll down, all of this other conversation occurs, and then all of a sudden, I come back to my conversation over here, okay? And about 130 seconds have expired, right here. In fact, 132 seconds. So what's the problem? I log in, the server starts talking to some other people for about 120 seconds, and then it comes back and and services me, okay? Everybody see that? See how easy that was? Okay. Now, I will caution you that, and this is my calculus speech, freshman year, calculus, professors up there doing all of the thing, and I'm sitting back like, yeah, that makes perfect sense. I get it, perfect, no problem, shit's easy. <laughs> Stuff is easy. <laughs> I go home, I'll edit that out, don't worry about it. I go home, I look at the problem, I'm like, what the hell did I do? Okay? And then it's only by through practice that it becomes easy. Okay? Calculus first semester isn't easy, 
until you get to second semester and you get a kind of feel for it. And then it's not easy until you learn differential equations, and then you're like, oh, okay, that's why that makes sense. And then that doesn't make sense until you learn linear algebra, and then everything else pretty much makes sense. Okay, so 2020 hindsight is extremely appropriate in our field. So the net message here is train your brain to follow a particular step. Don't deviate, follow the same step, and more often than not, you will find root cause. This is how long it took me to find root cause. Admittedly, I used a different tool, but essentially it's just diagramming. It's easier for me to see this and look at the keep, uh, track of time than scrolling through packets. All right? Yes, question. So what was the problem? Was it uh, authentication waiting to go to another method and like, yeah. find out who's down? Exactly. So you guys all have Google, right? Um, Google for the support number. You'll see here conversations starting on 7, I'll zoom in here, 765. If you Google it, you'll see that it's uh, NIS, okay? Uh, authentication. This was a misconfigured server that was supposed to authenticate you. This server was missed. They were not supposed to use NIS anymore. They were used, uh, using LDAP, I think it was LDAP. Um, now, so I just said that this was a, a misconfigured, one of many misconfigured servers. Uh, NIS was retired, and um, so what's the <coughs> obvious elephant <coughs> comment that you should be thinking about? This is that annoying four-year-old that I talked about. So let me state, set the stage again. I'm trying to log in, nothing happens. I now know that I'm going to authentication engine that's now been decommissioned. Um, should have been LDAP and it's not. Took 120 seconds of timeout, and I got to work it. What's the problem with that statement? I was authenticated. Yeah. Why was I able to continue working if the authentication engine was decommissioned and they couldn't find me in the database? So I did ask, and they said, oh, there was a residual database. But don't worry about it. I said, okay, I trust you. Okay. Um, so again, this is easy when I'm up here doing this fast, but I will tell you that it didn't take me that long to find this problem. If you follow my methodology of scrolling down, noticing that the conversation pair changes, okay? And I don't want you to, uh, this is kind of like, you know, um, uh, the great analogy, no, it's not a great analogy, but it's an appropriate analogy, is in the military, anybody here served in the infantry, in the army? Couple of, any combat, on, well, it has to be infantry because you have to be walking around. It doesn't help if you're driving a tank. In the infantry, they tell you at nighttime, don't look at something straight on. You have to use slightly left and right because you're because of your rods and cones, right? I don't remember which one's better, but of your in the back of your eye, made up of rods and cones, one works better at nighttime, and it's the one that doesn't work when you look straight on. So slightly off center, you can see better at nighttime. Same concept applies when you're dealing with all this information. You can't pinpoint on something, you'll have overload, your brain's gonna explode, but if you do this enough times, you can scroll down and immediately see change in pattern. That's what I want you to look for, okay? Who can't notice that I go from 1A to 1.68, 1.1, the column length here, and all of a sudden it becomes very chatty and the IP addresses change, okay? As I build up to more and more uh, example, you'll see that this, in fact, does happen, and it is very useful. But it's only useful if you train your eyes to do it. Okay? Yes, question seven. You're wrong. I, I didn't do that. You didn't do the flow list? No. No, I'm pretty sure you did. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but the source was from I will look it up. Huh? It was from Cisco. I don't know. <laughs> well, then you know what? Then you notify me. I'll dig up the email, because you. I think it was you that said, uh, did you write? Yeah. Well, maybe, okay, so maybe you did point it out to me and said, was this, uh, but it was about three days. Well, he did the SSL decode, so he can, he's got plenty of uh, stuff to, uh, and by the way, if you have, uh, Saga, are you doing your CLI or uh, T-shirt? No? no. SSL one? No. no? Which, which one are you doing? Capturing techniques. Capturing techniques. Capturing techniques. Okay. So I highly recommend Saki. He asked for a couple of the core developers here. Uh, by the way, thank you. Core developers, right? Um, all right. So, any other question? Yeah, I have a question. Yes. So, um, there were like four or five conversations all together. You know, typically we plug in an analyzer and there's 
thousands and thousands of conversations. So did you have to do anything up front to kind of narrow the, narrow the analysis? Okay, so the question was, um, there's thousands and thousands of conversations at times. How do you quickly filter it out, right? Uh, are there best practices? Uh, there are. There are some guidelines. Uh, first one is um, try to do it during off times. That's the obvious answer. Okay. The other one is um, what I recommend is try with a filter of just that conversation pair, okay, and then expand on it. If you can't find it by looking at just because what would the conversation packet capture look like when I captured it from the other side? It would look like this. And you will see this gigantic delay here. Okay. And nothing's, nothing of interest happens from this top part to this part. It just stops. Okay. There is something else, though, that you can look at. Sometimes it helps, sometimes it doesn't. And that is what I call the redheaded stepchild of packet analysis, IPID. Why do I look at the IP ID? So let's see if it holds true here or not. The IP ID um, at packet number 26, two minutes before the, the blackout condition occurred, was 61191. Everybody see 61191 there, right? Okay, decimal 61191, that's right there. This one is 61192. So, from an IP ID perspective, did anything else happen between this packet and this packet? No. A lot of times. A lot of times it will elapse. Is that what's okay? So a lot of times it will. Sometimes it doesn't. Okay? So why did I bring up the IP ID? So let me just kind of, I want you to visualize this. I usually have a chart uh, since we're on the topic of IP ID. There's only one IP stack. Okay, there's one guy doing IP handling duties, fragmentation, etc. There are multiple sockets of TCP conversation. They all go through the same IP stack. It's not like you have multiple IP stacks, right? So that IP ID's job is to hand out IP ID regardless of how many conversations, TCP conversations you have. Does that make sense? So if you have three sockets, email, web, and web, they all generate source destination socket, IP, TCP port number conversation, the tuple that we like to talk about, but they will all get the same incrementing IP ID going through the same tool. tool. So think about it this way. You got four lanes on the highway, on the road. Each lane is a socket, but you, there's only one toll booth. Okay, and all four lanes have to go through one toll booth, and the toll booth collector gives you a ticket and that increments numerically by one, sometimes by two but it's one, two, three. So IP ID is one way that you can judge how busy the other guy is. Even though I'm capturing from here, if my IP conversation goes from IP ID, you know, uh, 1,000 to 60,000, between those two packets from my perspective, the server, at a minimum, had 50,000 other packets that he sent out on the wire. Okay, so IP ID is useful. In fact, I don't know if Steve's in the audience. Um, oh, there he is right there. Okay, so I got an email from Steve. He, he used to come to Sharkfest and he's back this year. And I talked about IP ID using IP ID. And, and Steve asked me, hey, is there a way to visualize IP ID? And there is. Um, I can show you that later. Um, and what he found was that on the days the server is slow, the IP ID is almost twice, it cycles through almost twice as fast as when the server is not that busy or the user complaint is not there. Meaning, even though you're, the server is way over here and you're capturing from here, by tracking IP ID and how fast it increments, you can tell how busy the remote server is. Okay? The faster the turnover of IP ID, the busier that server is. But sometimes when you go through a load balancer, it does give you a dedicated IP stack. Okay? So sometimes IP ID will not help you. Okay? And this is one of those cases. So lesson learned there is know your environment and don't just make a conclusion. Oh, for 
120 seconds a server did absolutely nothing because that doesn't pass the smell test. Okay, a server for two minutes not generating one IP data graph doesn't make any sense. Okay? That's why you have to know your environment. Any yes, question back there. One of the things I think is just because it's not a So, okay, so there was the comment that IP ID um, could be for other conversations? I didn't quite... No, it, it may not be, even, even if the, even if the sender is in your previous capture, the one that you came to the example, the sender kept sending us the same packet and reusing the ID. Okay, okay, so, so I kind of skipped over the part of the Reddit step trial, that's why I, I called it the Reddit step trial, because it's not something that you can count on. Uh, in fact, if you read the RFCs, IP ID is absolutely not required. It can be zero. It can be some random number. To never increment. Why? Because unless you fragment the IP datagram, you don't need the IP ID. Okay. And in fact, I think there were some there were some hacks where people were using IP ID to send data out. Because if nobody's checking the IP ID, you can put characters in there and it'll work. And you can send a little message out using IP ID. Admittedly, it's not that many characters at a time, but given that you can send a million packets, you can create a sentence and just use this field here to create that sentence and send it out. All right? And, yes? I can't hear you. You have to I think I think I'm gonna cut you because I, I still can't hear you. I'm sorry. I, I can't off what I said. I, I think the comment was that you, if by you can jump. Um, and see how fast it's jumping, but, <clears throat> excuse me, but that because it cycles around, notice how many bytes there are, EF08, two bytes, uh, it's limited to 64, 655, and then it cycles back. So again, this is why IPID is not as reliable, but it is an arsenal that you can put in your toolkit. Okay, I don't know if that was a question, comment, or anything, but if it's not, let me know, and then we'll circle back, okay? So far, so, yes, question. They are not available right now, but they will be. There will be a link where you can download them uh, when you download the presentation. Okay, the question was, are the packet catchers available right now? Uh, just go back to my, when you download my PowerPoint, you'll see them, uh, you'll see a link there, okay? All right, so that was kind of easy, again. So now let's look at something that's a little bit more challenging, a little bit more interesting, okay? We've taken the training wheels off a little bit. And this is uh, an FTP job that was slow. <coughs> FTP and I don't really remember. But it's a file transfer that was slow. Okay? So let's apply my logic once again. And I'll start thinking loud. This is a packet capture 182.168 uh, and 10.10.10. .10 .10. Um, and I'm going to start scrolling down. Okay? This is what I do. First step, always scroll down. Already my brain is picking up some patterns that's making me go, hmm, I wonder why that is. Okay. So I'm going to scroll down a little bit more. What pattern do you recognize as I'm scrolling down? And this is the part where you have to really say out loud so I can hear you guys. 35 milliseconds of latency keeps popping up. Okay. Look at the delta here. There's 35 milliseconds, and you'll see that I'm looking for the, you know, obviously the last two digits are going to change, but you'll notice that repeatedly the 35 shows up. Okay? And that's absolutely correct. That's the first thing you should notice. That's why the delta column is there. What's the other thing that you notice? The, the length. Look at the length. Okay? There's repeating patterns here, right? 1456, 1456, 1382, 1456, 1456, 1382, 
1456, 1382. See that right here? You can see that as you scroll by as well. What else do you notice? There's one more thing that's very important. Now, obviously, we don't really care about the sequence number next. Expect the sequence number acknowledgement, acknowledgement for time being. That's always going to change. I don't really care. My brain tunes that out. Okay, it's noise. There's an act behavior. There's a push. And there's a push. Okay? Notice we see a pattern where we have acknowledgement. Okay, so the source destination, I'm not going to worry about for the time being. But you can see there's a push. Okay? There's a push. There's a push. And there's a push. Okay? All coming from 10 dot, the sender of the information. And there's something else that's common about that push bit. Which is what? Yes. Okay. So I think you jumped ahead and said, let's see the MSS, correct? Okay. So, so is it always three acts with a push? Is it, the question is, is it always three acts with a push? Maybe. We'll come back to that in just a second. So these are things that are going on in my brain. Everything that you're saying is happening in real time as I was troubleshooting this. Okay? The, the pattern that you should recognize so far, and you've seen this that it works, 35 milliseconds. There's a push, there's a, um, here's a 10 dot address guy, uh, and then he sends, sends, and then there's a push, send, send, push. Okay? The two send, sends that I just said shows 1390, and this push bit always has less than, it's always smaller. Okay? Notice, let me show you that again. Here is a 10.10 10 sending, okay? And the, and the, the packet length is 1390, or I should say that the data length is, the MSS is 1390. There's 1390 bytes of TCP data, 1390 bytes of TCP data, and then the guy with the push bit always has 1316. You see that? All right, and there's a push bit. So, in my mind, there's something else that I did, which is some rough calculation. So, 1390, right? You see the data graph size here, 1390, down here? 1390 plus 1316. 1390, two of those, and then 13, 16 plus, what number do you see there? 4096. It's a boundary number. It's a number that matches exactly to 1024, 2048, 4096, etc. Okay? There's also a push bit, which means what's happening at the application layer. Someone? Bruno, I'd say it's important. The push bit says, hey, it's important, take care of me. Okay? So push bit says, I'm important, take care of me. You know what, I'm sorry, can you just or, relay the message because it's very hard. I was just going to say the sender is probably clearing his buffer. Okay, so sender is clearing the buffer. Okay, any other? Yes. It's a flush. It's the flush, okay. So I want you to search up push bit. This is homework, okay. This is the part, this is the, this is left for the exercise for the reader part of the textbook. Look at the push bit because what you said, this is important, take care of me, versus this is important, I want you to transmit this immediately, okay, versus I'm going to flush the buffer and therefore a push bit gets set are all correct, depending on which part you read, okay. The one thing that is not correct is the push bit never causes a packet to be transmitted. That's a misnomer, okay. And you can read all about it in the TCP NATO delay that uh, article that I wrote, a video, it's a 30 minutes. Believe it or not, something as boring as what seems like a NATO and delay that took 30 minutes to explain. Okay? And if you read Stevens, it will say, don't ever think setting a push bit causes a packet to be transmitted. It doesn't. There are a bunch of different timers and conditions that you have to be met. However, 
flushing the buffer is correct. What, what do I mean by this? This is the application saying, hey, I'm going to give you 4,096 bytes of data, flush it. When you're done, come talk to me. I'll give you the next 4096 <coughs> bytes of data. Okay, does that make sense? So, with that in mind, let's keep troubleshooting because it turns out that's not the case. Okay? So I just said, wait, push bit, flushing the buffer, I'm not going to give you the next data until I get acknowledgement. What's that about? So let's troubleshoot, okay? All right, so we've got this instant app, and we can see here in the MSX section, um, there's 14 safety bytes. That's interesting. And come over here, and he says, I can do, in the Synac, um, fourteen oh two. So one guy says I can do fourteen sixty, which is a typical MSS size. Okay, this is how much data TCP can send. Okay, fourteen sixty plus twenty bytes of IP and twenty bytes of Ethernet header gets you fifteen hundred MQ, fourteen sixty. But the other guy says, hey, I can really only do fourteen oh two. Right? Where is it? Uh, fourteen oh two. Which already is kind of weird. Who the hell uses fourteen oh two as an MSS? Okay. This is one thing I, I, I haven't been able to answer. I don't know why anybody would use fourteen oh two. I tried different combinations of GRE header, IPsec header, and I can't come up with 1402. Okay? So likely somebody fat figured it. If you're using IPsec header, if you're using a GRE tunnel, tunnel um, these are things that you should account for to make it more efficient. Network routing and switching guys might cheat by adjusting the MSS on the router. My recommendation would be don't do that. Routers should just route and not muck around with these different packets. Also doesn't help you when you have B2B packets. But it is a quick bandage. All right, so. Wait, is that I'm sorry? That's the problem? No, it's not a problem. It's a question that I haven't been able to answer, uh, which is who the hell uses an MSS 1402? Okay. So likely it was a typo. That's my guess. All right, so um, let's follow this conversation. We're going to step it up and answer this question of flushing the buffer, 4096. These are all in the back of my mind. So let's start troubleshooting here. Uh, we have 25 minutes left, right? Okay, so good. We're on track. So this one's a little bit more involved. This is a little bit, and I want you to kind of um, keep up with me. If I'm going too fast, stop. And So the first thing we'll notice is that 10 is sending to 192.168. Okay, we got that covered. And this is my Cincinnati app. First thing that I'm asked, I've already answered in my head is, where am I capturing from? It's important to know, are you capturing from the sender? Or are you capturing from the receiver? Because a problem looks very different when you capture from the sender, when you capture from the receiver. Okay? As you become more uh, efficient at protocol analysis and more advanced, these are things that your brain will automatically register. Okay? So I have a SYN, SYN app, app. Where am I capturing from? Server being? 192. 192. You can guess the times between how long these takes, too. Yes. Like if your SYN comes in and the act is, the SYN act is stupid fast, which it is, but you're right next to what it That's right. So it's reasonably, we can reasonably argue that at some moment in time, this is the epoch, right? This is the big bang, beginning of time. The SYN act is in the microseconds, 166 microseconds. Okay? It's immediate. So obviously, I must be closer to uh, 192.168.1.1. And then, so the SYN comes in, the SYN act goes out, and then finally the act has to come back, and that took about 35 milliseconds. I can reasonably conclude that my round trip time is 35 milliseconds away. It also jives with the fact that we see this recurring 35 milliseconds in the delta call. Okay? So I filed that away in my brain. And then, the server took some time, I don't know why, he took an additional 46 milliseconds or so, and he sent me data. 
It's right there, 1390. It doesn't have a push fit. It's one packet. And then the next thing that happens is my guy acknowledges that packet. This is another case where I went, hmm, that's weird, but I haven't been able to get an answer, which is what? I get a packet. It's 1390. Uh, within 98 microseconds, I get an acknowledgement back. Okay, it's this pack acknowledgement for packet number four. So the three-way handshake occurs. The server took some time. This is server delay, by the way. For whatever reason, house cleaning, doing something. It took some time, 46 milliseconds. Um, well, it's not really 46 because I have to account for it. 17 milliseconds of one-way latency, right? It took 17 milliseconds for that to traverse. So he took some time to craft this packet and send it out on the wire, and I immediately acknowledged it. Okay? So there's a part of me that went, that's weird. I wonder why it did that. Okay? I'm not going to talk about it. We'll come back to it later. But you should be thinking, if you don't know why I'm thinking this is weird, you should be asking yourself, why does he think it's weird? Okay. Does that make sense? All right, anyway. Uh, and then um, I see here the server sent another packet, 1390. Now, there's a lesson to be learned right here, which is I just made an assumption that a lot of people make when you first start. And what is that assumption that I just made that can lead you down the wrong path? You have to keep the time of flight time in mind when you troubleshoot. So let me just repeat what I just said. I see a packet show up, I acknowledge it, which I went, that's weird, and then another packet showed up. That's not technically correct. Why? Because I'm going to use control T, okay? Control T is time reference. You should use it constantly to reset the clock. It helps you in troubleshooting. When I hit control T, it becomes time reference, and the time since the beginning of capture zeroes out. Okay? It's easier to zero out the time because things will pop at you uh, as opposed to keeping track of all these numbers here. Your brain's not very good at that. So I hit control T, new beginning of time, and packet, acknowledgement, packet. How long did this third packet that I just highlighted, packet number six, how long was that since the beginning of time? 134 microseconds. Okay. Right? You can see that. So at some moment in time, the server sent this packet. It's coming in flight. 17 milliseconds, one-way latency. For 17 milliseconds, the sky is flying. I immediately acknowledge it. Then I immediately see another packet, which means... Question or comment? Or? Oh, sorry. Oh, okay. They crossed, they crossed in flight. Ships in the night. Don't make the assumption that this packet showed up because I acknowledged it. Because unless you beat the laws of physics, that cannot happen. Let me reiterate what I just said. Because it's important. This packet left the station at the other side. Okay? And it took 17 or so milliseconds to come. As soon as it shows up my door, I immediately acknowledge, which again I went, why is that? But then immediately I see another packet show up. So in fact, two packets left that station. Okay? So this 10 dot guy sent this packet and this packet at the same time, back to back. It just so happens that I acknowledge this packet right as this one was arriving. Make sense? Okay. So again, the reason why I teed it up in that was it's easy for us when we're graphically looking at this to mentally think, okay, a packet was sent, I acknowledged it, he sent me another one. And that's not correct. He sent two. Okay, so now I have the baseline. He sent two packets. So it's this one, packet number four, packet number six. I still don't have a push bit there. Okay. I send an acknowledgement. You, you can see here, you can see it two ways. You can see the easy way is this packet that I highlighted is acknowledging packet number six. Very dead simple. 
The other way to look at it is the act field should match the next expected sequence number. Okay, this is why I have these columns. Because I can quickly see, without even looking at this, that this acknowledgement 2781 is saying, I'm good up to 2781. I got it. Okay? So you'll see here in just a second that I use a step ladder method to uh, track packets. And um, what I mean by that is 1 to 1391, 1391 to 2781, 2781 to 41871, 4171 to 5561, 5561 to 6951, 6951 to 8341. Okay? It takes a lot longer to say it than for your brain to process it, but you're seeing this continuous transfer of datagram with no missing packets, by the way. Right? So continuous. All right. So let's recap. I see a packet here. Um, I get two packets. And then there is a considerable delay before the next packet shows up. So let's think this through. This is very important. Okay? These little niggling things, you can't just gloss over because it'll take you down the wrong path. Okay? This is what separates someone who does protocol analysis for a living versus someone who opens up Wireshark because they're curious and they're learning. These, these are important things. So we already said that these two packets, packet number four and six, left the station at the same time. I acknowledged it. How long does that acknowledgement take to get to the other side? About 17 milliseconds. Yes, question? Yeah, 17 is one way. 35 is round trip, so I'm just calling it 17, I think 17 and a half, 18, whatever. So in your mind, draw a little diagram, and if it helps, I did this, draw bounce diagrams, okay? Say, okay, this packet left, uh, 100 milliseconds later, this packet left, I acknowledged it, the time there was 17 milliseconds, and then for him to send me something else, takes another 17 milliseconds, right? Okay. This is where the flow graph would absolutely help. That's correct. Okay? But in the interest of time, I'm skipping that part. Okay. All right. Um, because the flow graph is a sequence bounce diagram. Right? Um, so I see here two packets were sent. I acknowledged it. And then he didn't send until I acknowledged him. I know that for a fact now. Because this packet, number seven, that I acknowledged the previous two packets, took 17 milliseconds to get to him. And then he sent another packet, and it took 17 milliseconds to get to me, which is why it took 35 milliseconds. Okay? And, and he has a push pack there. And then, how many does he send now? He sent this one. So let's do control T. New time reference. This is the new train station from him leaving towards me. Okay, I reset the time. So I know that this left, this left, this left, and this left, okay? Did everybody see that? So this is a new train departure time. Okay. Those of you that commute by train, you know this very well. This is a train time station. You gotta get to the station because it's leaving. This is when it left. One, two, three, four. And then I acknowledge packet number 12, and then once that acknowledgement hits, I get more data. So what just happened? I got two datagrams, I acknowledged it. How many datagrams did I get in the second part? Four. And then he sent some more. So what happened there? Two and four. What does that sound like? It doubled. It, it doubled. For every packet was acknowledged, it sends one more. Okay. So the, the statement was for every packet that we acknowledged, he sent some more. Okay. But it's not on a per packet basis. Just, yeah. TCP win. Can you take more? So this is a TCP window. Maybe, maybe not. Slow start. Slow start. Maybe this is slow start. Okay. Slow start is where TCP ramps up. Okay. So TCP's job, and this is this is the aha moment that Dr. Van Jacobsen had when ARPANET was crashing. Okay. So if you heard his keynote speech a couple years back. And then if you, uh, the follow-up, which was Dr. McCann, keynote speech, um, and Dr. McCann's my hero. He was a mentor of mine. Uh, he worked for Riverbed. He doesn't know that he's a mentor of mine, um, but he was my mentor. And uh, stalking probably comes to mind. <laughs> <laughs> but he's the guy, and no, I'm just kidding. He and I have a very good relationship. He knows that I look up to him. Um, 
He's the guy that created the back end perfect uh, BPF filter, um, and he's the one that worked with Dr. Ben Jacobson to help figure out that congestion leads to constant ramp up crash, ramp up crash, ramp up and crash. Okay, this is like going, getting to the red uh, every block you hit a red light and you're not really going very fast. Okay, so that's what uh, Dr. Van Jacobson used TCP dump and BPF filter to figure out that hey, it's better to go slow and steady and figure out how much the network can take before just sending everything out there and crashing, causing congestion to crash. Okay, that was a seminal paper on uh, congestion control. Okay. Um, so now we know that this could be a slow start. Okay, so in other words, two datagram came. I acknowledged it. He sent me four. I acknowledge it. Let's keep following. Okay, now we're, now we're cooking with gas. So here's my acknowledgement for packet number 12, which is 8431, 8341. Life is good. New time of reference. Okay, I said the new, this is the new training meeting schedule. Okay, let's see how long, how many data grams he sends me this time. Data there, one, two, three, four, five, six, six this time. 246. Okay? I like to have seen 248, but I'll take 246. Okay, so we can see him ramping up. Two datagram, acknowledgement. Four datagram, acknowledgement. Six datagram, acknowledgement. Okay? However, we see here this one has an act, okay, meaning there's no push on the right hand side. Okay? So this is datagram, datagram, push. He flushed a buffer. But he continued on. He didn't stop for this push bit to be acknowledged. He continued on and went data, data, data. The second push bit is here. The second flushing of the buffer. And then we stop. Everybody see that? Okay. So what we're seeing, yes, question. Are you grouping those packets together because of the time reference is such a short period of time? Yeah. So, yeah, I'm using time reference because it's easier for me to see that this is 540 microseconds than clearing that out and trying to keep track of all these digits. So I'm being lazy. Okay. Oh, yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah, I see. If I had a, if I had a little trust to give you, I would give you some. The question was, why do I set time reference when the delta time is here and the time elapses beginning of uh, is here? It's because Human brain has a hard time making sense of big numbers like this. So if I come over here and do a time reference, I can clearly see that it's only been 300 microseconds to this point in time. So this is resetting your uh, beginning of time counter. So it's, it's a technique that I use, very helpful in trying to figure out did these train pack these packets are trained all in at the same time, or was there some noticeable gap? Okay. Just a helpful aid that I use. All right, so we went two, four, six, and then the pattern is two datagram flush, meaning two, I don't want to say full-size packet, but let's say for the time being, that's a full-size packet, okay, 1390. So two packets, followed by flushing of the buffer, slightly less, this one, 1168, two more datagram packets, followed by push, okay, and then we stop. What am I doing here? I'm doing this. I have some data to send, okay? And TCP is a stream-oriented protocol. But I asked a question because it's important. Because people will give me answers all day. TCP, connection-oriented. What does that mean? Sync and act has to happen. Without sync and act, nothing happens. Flow control. It handles flow control. How? It's just an algorithm that we talked about. Flow start. Okay, congestion avoidance. These are all flow control. The other one is stream oriented. What does it mean to be stream oriented? Okay. There is no beginning. There is no. But I asked a question because it's important. See, people will give me answers all day. TCP, connection oriented. What does that mean? Since and act has to happen. Without since and act, nothing happens. Flow control. It handles flow control. Ah, congestion algorithm that we talked about. Slow start. Okay. Congestion avoidance. These are all flow control. The other one is stream-oriented. What does it mean to be stream-oriented? There is no beginning, there is no end to a TCP session. Once you open up that connection, all you've done is created a hose from point A to point B. It's up to the application to fill that hose with data. 
It could be continuous, or it could be chunks of data, TCP doesn't care. Ideally, you would like it to be continuous flow of water. But being that we're in a drought situation in California, see how I worked that out? <laughs> it's not. So we're going to use buckets to transfer. The application, instead of using a giant pail of water to pour into that hose, says, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to dole out little portions of water to you and put it in the hose and you TCP take care of it. And what I'm using is two cups worth 4096. Okay? Not one cup full, because if it was one cup full, after every 4096 or the push bit, you would see a delay. So let's show it to you from a packet analysis standpoint. Here's data, data, end of that data with a oh, sorry. Let's find the push one here. So I come to here. Notice that there's a full size, okay? Full size and a push bit. That's my cup full of data, 4096. Normally, I would stop there until you told me you got that cup before I give you another cup full of data. In this case, there seems to be two cups in use. Does that make sense? So the application is sending, scooping out two cups worth 4096 bytes, dumping it into the hose, and then I dump the first cup, I dump the second cup, and then I stop and wait for that acknowledgement for that second cup before I continue on. Which means, what's my throughput? 4096 times 2 by round trip time. It's hor horrendous throughput because I can never get beyond 4096, 4096 because then I have to wait for that cup to be the two cups to be acknowledged before I continue on. Okay? Actually, as you go through this trace file, you will see that as soon as one cup full is uh, acknowledged, I send you another cup. So I have two cups, two hands, okay, and I'm pouring the water. I can't pour more than two cups of data, but as long as I get one cup acknowledged, I'm free to send another one. Okay? Or I can send two at a time, but no more than two cupfuls, which means I can never send more than 4096 times 2 at a time. Does that make sense? Why is this interesting? Because in most cases, when you see the push bit, this is the application saying, I know we have a hose, I know we have connectivity, I know you're reliable, I know you retransmit for me, but I don't trust you, I'm going to give you a little doleful, a little buckets, a little spoonful of data. So the moral lesson here is that when you see push bit, think, crap, it's going to be latency sensitive. The more push bits you have, the more latency sensitive it's going to be. Okay? So I'll give you a preview to chapter 7 or 8 of my book that I stopped writing, for those of you that were curious. <laughs> it's not because I'm lazy. It's because I had to uh, do 150% of my time to things that were happening at my company, and so I had to pause it. But I will continue on. I'm up to chapter 3. Uh, and that is, before you do a data center migration, find out what, how the applications are talking. And if you see a lot of push bits, don't separate them. The application will break. Simple as that. Okay. Yes, question. Okay. So the comment was TCP window size was much bigger. We saw that it was 3264K. In this case, TCP window size has nothing to do with throughput because I got this giant highway, okay, a gigantic hose, fireman's hose, or bigger, a sewer maybe, and I'm putting two cups of water at a time. So TCP window size will never be the gating factor. Okay. However, you, you should check to make sure, and you will see how TCP window size does become a gating factor as you do some additional troubleshooting. I may have some of that on Thursday or maybe even today. Okay, does that make sense? All right, so. Let's see if this pattern continues. So let's randomly come down here. Um, and so this is my beginning of time. I hit control T, time reference. How many, how many packets, how many trains have left the station at a moment in time? Let's see, I got one, here two, uh, three, here's my push bit. I immediately continue with um, this, this, and this push bit, and I stop. And I wait for an acknowledgement before I continue on. Do you see that 35 milliseconds? <coughs> There's something else that happened here, which is between this cupful from here, here to here, 
Okay. There was a slightly bigger delta from here to here. So maybe there's a 50 microseconds of overhead for that application to give me that second. So these are all reasonable conclusions that you can make. Okay. Now, I'm, I said I'm a visual guy. Let's look at it with the Stevens graph. Because Stevens graph is something that you should use. You can use TCP trace graph if you like. Uh, but any throughput issue, use Stevens graph, and I'm going to show you how to do it now. Oh my god, I'm out of time. Where was my warning? You were wait. You were giving me the one, weren't you? I'm not, I have my reading glasses on. Okay, so uh, let's go to my Stevens graph. Looks good, right? Straight up. So this is Stevens graph, real quickly, is over time on the bottom how much data I've transferred. So this is, you're adding up sequence numbers. Okay, how many bytes I've transferred. The, the sharper the, uh, the slope, the greater it is. This doesn't look bad, right? You're like, oh, there's nothing wrong with this. That was in the detail, so let's zoom in. Uh -huh. Now, it's a little bit more interesting. Let's zoom in a little bit more. And what do we see? We see exactly what we just saw at the packet level. Six dots, meaning six packets. <coughs> so from here, let me zoom in a little bit more. Okay. At this point in time, six trains left the station instantaneously, or a couple hundred microseconds, and until the acknowledgement came for this two cups of data, so the first three dots represents the data, data, push, data, data, push, two cupfuls of data, that's it, I stop. I get the acknowledgement, another cup, another cup, I stop, another cup, another cup, I stop. Yes? Why, why was it, why is it set, is the set buffer set to uh, 4096? So why was the set buffer set to 4096? No idea. <laughs> Okay. No clue. We did. We did. So what we did was, this was a commercial application, and they had this thing called, um, I'm trying to remember, something buffer. Okay. And uh, because this was supposed to be a LAN application, it never really, no one ever really saw anything because when you're having microseconds of delay, okay, you can still use this kind of buffer size to work. But they had two buffers. Each buffer was 4096. That was the gaming uh, factor. They actually recompiled this to have over 128k of buffer size, and it went up. Uh, it went from you know days after the data center migration to a uh, few minutes. And that's how much difference you can make by setting the buffer size. Unfortunately for us, it's only the application that can send that buffer size. Nothing that we can do. Your job is to rule out. Congestion, rule out retransmission, rule out TCP window. You're pumping up the TCP window size. That's not good. Increase it. Okay? And I wish I had more time to show you that TCP window, windowing effect, but uh, unfortunately I'm out of time. Okay. So, thank you very much.